Thank you, Peter. Good morning. My name is Barb Campbell, and I am a wife and a mother of four and an educator, and I'm currently a Leading Excellence Fellow at Yes Prep Public Schools here in Houston. And it is an honor to be here and share my thinking as well as my thoughts on what's possible in education. So I first want to start off with a story to try and illustrate my kaleidoscope mind. And Peter, thank you for that term because it's much prettier than what feels like is happening in my mind on a daily basis. So this summer, I had a rather surreal experience as I was plucked out of my normal life in Houston that's rather busy and plopped right there into the Big Apple in New York City to attend a five week long uh, leadership development institute at NYU. I left behind my family, my husband and our four kids, hope they would survive, <laughs> and began uh, living with 130 other educational leaders from around the country, living in a dorm, like reliving the undergrad days with Spartan furnishings and uh, you know, roommates and uh, waste expanding meal plan. It was an absolute incredible experience, and though I missed the comforts of home and my family dearly, I really will always treasure that experience as it gave me a rare space and time to think and reflect and gave me a tremendous personal and professional insight into how I think. So as we walked in on our last week together as this cohort of 130, we enter the classroom and we find a baggie with 15 puzzle pieces in it. Remember, there's 130 of us, right? 130 people, 15 pieces in a baggie, and we're told to construct this puzzle by the end of the week. We have no idea what the picture is. We have no time allotted to do so, no process. Somebody smartly went up and wrote a note on the board saying, bring your puzzle pieces to this table and put the uh, corner pieces in the upper right-hand corner of the table. I thought, good move. For me, Unfortunately, the day of our facilitator had unwittingly created the perfect storm. My highest uh, trait, my strength, is responsibility. I have, I'm kind of off the charts when it comes to optimism. I love and relish a good challenge. I'm a little competitive. My highest character trait uh, is grit. And those who know me, a few of in the audience, might say that I have some obsessive compulsive tendencies. So. From that day forward, I literally skipped lunch to linger over that puzzle table. Crazy, I know. But for me, I really needed to connect. I needed to find the edges and create a framework to construct and figure out the scope of that project and get a kind of early mental win to know what we we're going to attempt to tackle. So I borrowed uh, some trays from our breakfast table and sorted the inside puzzle pieces into their respective color families. And my hope was that I could uh, break the project down into manageable chunks and expand our working space and also see some patterns uh, emerging. So as I was staring into one of the platters, I looked and I started to see Danny and Michael and Ty and Carolyn staring back at me. And so as I'm seeing these faces, I think, OK, we've got a picture. And the other colors match the t-shirts that we were wearing when we were at our orientation. So great. But I'm thinking through this task, and I see this puzzle. And it reminds me of how I tend to operate when confronting a problem. I have to construct that mental framework, get that in place, and metaphorically you know, turn over each puzzle piece to sift it and sort it into their respective shapes and color families to, to make sense of it. It's very overwhelming. It's oddly exhilarating. But I tend to retreat during that time to reflect and to read. And distractions are difficult for me to manage. But the lesson for me is that I, I have to find that connection. Where, where does it fit in? How does that connect before I can move forward? My second aha came with a little bit of frustration. As I noticed, even after repeated announcements had been made, there were some people who hadn't brought their pieces to the table. <laughs> I didn't have all the edges. <sighs> It made me acutely aware of how critical it is that everyone bring their time, their talent, their treasures and resources to bear on a, on a problem, their pieces of the puzzle to the table. Now, rather than get angry, which was my first reaction, I just took it as another data point on my learning curve and thought, not everyone is going to be responsive to a one-size-fits-all verbal request. And my way of thinking about the problem may not work for everybody. 
So now that we finally had the pieces and we started to make some headway in the puzzle, you could start to see what it looked like. People started to gravitate towards it. Some looked on and hesitating, looking curiously. And if we could drag them in and say, hey, Eric, would you mind for just taking five minutes and sort the solid black ones into their shapes? They generally would do so. And by the way, if you're a parent, great strategy for getting your kids to clean the house. But to maximize that outcome then, I need to find ways to personalize the process and engage people in the activity and the thinking. The final third insight that I had as we were dealing with this puzzle, we weren't necessarily making the type of progress that made me feel real optimistic that we were gonna get there by the end of the week. So we're stalling out a little bit and thought, what do I need to do here? Think back to some of the lessons we've learned throughout the summer. And we had done, some of you may have done Carter racing in your studies, but it's basically an exercise where you don't have a sufficient amount of information to make a good decision, but no one seems to ever ask for it. So I thought, I need to really ask questions, seek other sources of information. So I asked the summer interns, is there any chance that you have the puzzle box top? Yeah, and they gave it to me. <laughs> Should have had that on Monday, would have been a little helpful. But to ask questions, seek information, look for untapped resources, really serves to revitalize my mind and energy around a problem and helps us to see things from a fresh perspective. Unfortunately, as we got to the end of the week, the puzzle was incomplete. <laughs> I was tempted to pull an all-nighter. Remember, I'm living in college, right? So, um, but I was also in New York City, so Broadway, going out to dinner. Yeah, I didn't do it. So I came in that last day. We're packing up. We're exhausted. We're heading home, and there's that puzzle. I'm heading out the door, and Dave says, Hey, Barb, don't you want to take the puzzle home with you? The very thought... <laughs> of everything we had worked on all week, going over there and breaking it apart. So not only have I failed in doing the, the task, now I have to break it apart and put it in a box. About killed me, but I said, sure. Took it as a final gift on my learning journey for the summer. I tried carefully to slide them in chunks into the box, packed it neatly in my carry-on bag, headed to the airport and vowed that we'd finish it back home in Houston. When I got home, I managed to engage the Campbell crew uh, in this lovely task of completing the puzzle. And we spent some quality time as a family assembling that 2,000 piece beast of a puzzle. And ultimately, we were successful. If you look carefully at the puzzle, you may notice something. <laughs> yes, there's one piece missing. And I plead to anybody who attended, if they still have that piece, I'm still looking for it. <sighs> it's going to be okay. It's the process, right? Not the product. <sighs> Similarly, in K through 12 education, there seems to be something missing, and we're constantly seeking to find that one piece that will complete the puzzle. But the reality is, the picture of education going forward may look vastly different than the picture on the puzzle box top that we've been using to guide us. Take a look at this graph. If you look at the reading and the math scores, this is 1970 to 2008. In my mind, that, that's a flatline emergency situation and something needs to be done to change that graph. I think it's time for a little educational cardiopulmonary resuscitation. We need to look at ways and consider ways to find connections for students to help personalize their learning, and to ultimately revitalize education. To bring learning to life and bring life to learning. Schooling should provide students with a compelling reason to learn, a connection to something bigger than just standardized tests. Kids need to connect their knowledge and skills and apply them in authentic and meaningful contexts. How much more powerful is it when doing the standard resume writing assignment if you connect with a local women's shelter and develop a real resume to help someone get a real job? Or imagine if a student is empowered and given the freedom to select an area of an issue in their community to research and use that to demonstrate their knowledge and their writing capabilities. Or consider the value of having chemistry students not just work in the lab, but in the field, 
and assess the local water quality. I was blessed to work in a school district, Humble ISD, for 17 years that really valued service learning. They sought opportunities to make that connection between the curriculum and the community. One of our local middle schools, and the principal's here today, created a very rich environment, uh, one that nurtured that serving culture. So students felt empowered when they learned that World War I was the only war that didn't have a national monument on the mall in D.C. to honor its veterans. Students took action and they started, they studied the stages of war and influenza and poetry from the era. They researched the genealogy of their own families to figure out if they had relatives who had served. Docents, they had connected with uh, David DeYoung, an amazing photographer, who had portraits of the last 13 veterans at the time who were still living from World War I. And student docents learned their stories. They put together an amazing community-wide event to share their knowledge and share the stories that they, had, that they had learned. They really brought history alive for our whole community. The last living veteran at the time was Frank Buckles, and this is a picture of Katie and Seth and Hannah with their little flat Stanleys. We actually sat on his porch in West Virginia. It's the most humbling moment of my life to be in such great presence. Companies have developed corporate social responsibility programs wherein they use their core competencies to really make an impact on their local and global communities. Our schools need to do more of the same. There's opportunities, both big and small, for students to apply their skills and really have a positive impact. When we make those connections explicit for students, those connections to learning, we not only hold them responsible for learning, but we also give them the ability to respond and be real world problem solvers. To bring learning to life and bring life to learning. Schooling should provide students with an opportunity to increase their capacity to learn. Several years ago, my dad had open heart surgery. And I recall afterwards that he had to blow into this spirometer, which is why it's my visual anchor. But each day, he was challenged to, to push that ball just a little bit higher. And of course, he's competitive too, so therefore, I had to play the game. But anyway, <sighs> yes, he's like 70, 70, beat me. Um, but the point being, our lung capacity is not fixed just as our capacity to learn and grow is not fixed, nor is it predetermined by our zip code, our skin color, or our early academic experience. Carol Dweck is a psychologist from Stanford, and she's done a great deal of work in this area on success and achievement, and developed that simple concept of mindset. It's powerful. If you have a growth mindset, then you believe that your intelligence and your skills, they can be developed through hard work and dedication. And the flip side is also true if you have a fixed mindset. So do we truly believe that all students can learn? Or are they just words that are painted on the walls in some of our schools? If we are to act in accordance, we need to meet students where they are, set high expectations, and provide ongoing customized support. Now one way of doing so, we've talked about this morning, is through technology. And forgive me, I'm an old social studies teacher. So a little history. Um, fourth century BC, if you were one of the chosen few who were going to learn, you learned at the foot of a master from their every word. Jump ahead. 15th century AD, and Gutenberg comes along. Printing press. Now books are available. It's interesting that there was actually great resistance to the use of books as a teaching tool. It was inconceivable that one might be able to actually learn from a book. Now in the 21st century, we're faced with similar objections and resistance to technology. Education hasn't quite figured out how to capitalize on technology to increase its productivity. You saw the graph earlier. Spending per pupil continues to rise, but we're not getting a corresponding increase in results. Technology can be one way to overcome geographic constraints and provide and open up a whole world of possibilities 
for students. If you're interested, Google School of One to see how it can be done. Talk about differentiating learning. So technology won't, won't not only will capitalize or stretch the almighty dollar and help us to spend a little bit more wisely, but also to stretch students' capacity to learn. To bring learning to life and bring life to learning, schooling should also provide opportunities for creativity, which you'll hear about a lot today, and open up some space for innovation. I was blessed this May to have earned my MBA at Rice and participate in their education entrepreneurship program. Wow, great opportunity to cross-pollinate between industries, and we were exposed to incredible, brilliant minds in education, like Rick Hess, who challenged us to think beyond what can't be done to think about what we want to accomplish, and then just to look and see if our schools are configured in a way to do so. And if they're not, what should we do? In my second year with the MBA, we actually got to customize our learning and take some classes of our own choosing. And I read uh, The Seven Day Weekend, love the title. And the, the CEO and president had me at hello as he fancied himself the chief enzyme officer and throughout the book, they talked about ways that he empowered the employees and gave them the freedom to bring their skills to the table and devise um, ways to operate. And the company was wildly successful because he encouraged them to ask why, to question. That's not necessarily rewarded in education. The, my little CEO in my life, this is our youngest baby. He is definitely a catalyst. <laughs> I taught him, we all play in the kitchen, the kitchen together, and I, um, just like my mother taught me, that baking is not necessarily forgiving. You have to measure very accurately, and you need to have the leavening agent just right. If we're missing something in education, it's that leavening agent. It's what my friend Kathy Berger Kay in service learning talks about as the bounce. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about when kids, they're so excited when they're little, they literally bounce. Yet somehow along the way we teach them that they have to sit still and listen to learn. I want to wrap up with just one last story as it frames the way I think and I think it applies here. Several years ago, I decided to try and stay home, be, a, be an at-home mom. I learned very quickly that role was not well aligned with my skill set for the sake of my children. I did return to the workforce after one year. <laughs> but in that time, I got a little nugget from Dr. Phil. <laughs> I think I spent the first five years of my marriage thinking about what my husband needed to do differently or to change to make our marriage better. And Dr. Phil thought, the question that's more important to ask is what do I need to do today to be a better wife? What do I need to do today to be a better mother? So I think we need to stop wasting our energy looking out the window and asking or complaining about what others are doing or not doing. Teacher quality, student motivation, funding, the list goes on and start looking in the mirror and thinking about what I can do today to better serve the children in my life. What can we do today in our schools and our systems to better serve our students? Concerning ourselves about who is delivering educational services and where the ideas are coming from is fruitless. Whether it's the charter networks, traditional public schools, home schools, private schools, we are all in this for the public good. Interestingly, even CPR now is offered by a multitude of organizations and you can get your card online. Education is like no other industry in the world. Our product is more precious than gold. It's puzzling to say the least, but we are all stakeholders and we need to bring our unique pieces to the table. We need to take collective ownership for education in our great nation to bring learning to life and bring life to learning. What will you do 
today. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of your talk. Thank you. A bark. Um, and first, can I say, you didn't tell us about this little question and answer session until last night. OK, go ahead. Let me improvise. <laughs> As an education innovator, I've always wanted to ask someone like you the following question. Why is it that in our country we disrespect and dismiss educators? What is it about our history, perhaps? Because I came from Asia, and in the Confucian model of social hierarchy, the top spot goes to scholars. We value scholars just for pursuing knowledge. In Finland, it's legally mandated that teachers are accorded the same amount of, I think, respect and pay as doctors and lawyers. In Japan, by law, at least in the past, they must receive 10% more pay than other public servants. So why, why is it in this country, teachers have to work a second or third job and get no respect? That's a great question, Peter. <laughs> and, and, and like an earlier uh, <laughs> participant said, if I had the answer to that, I might be rich. But certainly, that the notion of, of respect, uh, I hate to go back to the pay issue, but how we perceive that and value mm -hmm. athletes. Wow, you can have a $1.5 million contract mm -hmm. and artists and uh, you know, something is completely out of whack there in how we prioritize. So, yes. I mean, are, are we the ones to blame for what we've created? If you were an employer today, would you, how would you assess the competitiveness of, say, a high school graduate, if you have insight, against high school graduates of the past from this country or current high school graduates from other countries? Yeah, I'm not sure I could give perspective on mm. graduates from other countries. I, I, you know, I just wish that we would continue to provide students with greater opportunities to yes. see that making those connections for them because we're not, I don't feel like we're giving them the skills they need to be adaptable and flexible mm. to go into those various roles. We know each other from work done at Humble ISD and one powerful aspect of service learning that I really appreciate, based on what you've told me, is that I think young people who get involved in service learning develop a sense of agency, that they can be the agent for a change, that they don't have to simply step, step back and say, wow, the world's happening out there, I'll simply sit back and observe. They can say, I can be part of that world and take some action to impact my world. I think that may be perhaps one of the most powerful legacies of service learning. Absolutely, and what was so cool for me in working with the, the middle school, I was at the high school level, but watching those kids then come through having had that experience yes. of empowerment and feeling like they could really make an impact, then they came to the high school where I was and they'd come by and say, Miss Campbell, we need to talk, da, 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 da. and they'd have this idea, okay, go to your history teacher, see if, it was phenomenal to yes. see, especially Seth and Katie and Hannah, they, they were completely empowered to make those connections. Yes. Thank you so much, Thank Barb. you, Peter. Pleasure.